it's kind of more of a best practices thing, and of course, it's presented to you by author and affiliation. <laughs> so, uh, CFD is nothing without visualization. Okay, it's like you're you're in the dark. You have to visualize what you're looking at. So, relying on a good visualization package and good visualization practices is essential to doing CFD. I cannot count, I do not remember the number of times I found bugs thanks to my visualization um, practices and the package that I use Visit. Okay, it is instrumental, it's unbelievably useful. Okay, so don't dismiss that as just producing beautiful plots. Yeah, you wanna produce beautiful and awe-inspiring simulations, but you also, it's a useful tool in debugging as well, okay? Now, as much as this can be helpful, it can also be misleading because you can be distracted by a beautiful looking vortex that's spinning in the wrong direction, okay? So don't let that dismay you. Beautiful, nice looking pictures are not proof of good results, okay? And with time, you will develop intuition and as you learn more about fluids, you'll be able, some people will look at a simulation, yeah, this is wrong here, right there. How did you know, right? So that comes with time, okay? You, I cannot teach you that. Only you can teach yourself that. And you mimic, you learn from, you know, working with more experienced colleagues. They, you learn that, you, you observe their process and you try to kind of, extract knowledge from how their brain operates, okay? And then with, with experience, you'll be able to beat that, okay? So some known packages, PlataView, Visit, Maya VI, and Mayavi, whatever they call it, and TechPlot. I use Visit extensively. It's an open source um, visualization package uh, that accepts a ton of different formats, okay? Um, it's pretty cool, pretty nice, developed by um, Livermore, Lawrence Livermore, and uh, we have some people working on our team who collaborate with them all the time, so we have a two-way um, communication with them. When we need features, we ask them to do it or redo it, and then we move it into the main um, main code. So some tips for visualization, and these are, I'm starting to build this lecture together. Um, I have a lot of examples, didn't have time to put everything together because I need to go back. I wish I saved every instance where I found a bug um, or I did something stupid and silly in, the, in my code and then visualization uh, allowed me to detect that. I wish I had um, all of those examples. I can't go back because I fixed the code thanks to visualization, but I'll give you a few tips. So um, one thing is um, to fix the color map. So once you are certain, and I've been going through this back and forth with, with Mockbell, it's a great example. Um, this is the Taylor Green Vortex, and w we're looking at certain trends in the solution, okay? But let's say you verified your code, you know your solution is good, and um, you know you wanna go and present your results. And I'm gonna show you two, I'm gonna show you the first simulation without fixing the color map. Okay, and I'm gonna run it. So this is without a moving reference frame. So this is the Taylor Green Vortex, this is just stationary in time, okay, almost stationary. Okay, you're like, what is, you know, the, f the physical reality is that this thing should dissipate. So reporting your results with a variable color map that's actually is not showing here on purpose because typically when you are reporting your results, you're just like grabbing whatever resolution your, your video has, it's, gonna, it's not gonna even show on here, so make sure you, f you correct that. But over here, the color map is changing, the min and max are changing. And look over here what I did, I fixed the color map to the min and the max at the initial condition. Okay, so look what happens. This is actually what's happening. It's dissipating, okay, it is dissipating. So fixing the color map actually doesn't doesn't lead the audience to believe that, oh, you know, these vertical structures, I mean, they're still there, right? So, but if you're producing reporting meaningful results, fix the color map, man. Fix it across even different simulations, different parameters, so that we can compare apples to apples. Let's say you run two simulations with different 
in, in different properties, you know, different diffusion coefficients. Fix the temperature color map so that we can compare the two. So that green on plot one is equal to green on plot two. Okay? Don't use a different color map for that matter. Now there's a reason to be made not to fix the color map. So if I am digging deep into the solution and I want to see every single cell inside the sim inside a s you know at the end at T end, I am not going to fix the color map because I want that I want any weird features to really pop. Okay, so go if I go back to the previous one, um, if you go to the end, you notice how this blob shrinks like this. So that tells me something important about this particular simulation. And I couldn't see that if I ran the other plot because the other plot dissipated it before I could see the shrinking. Okay, so there's a case to be made for both ends. But when you are reporting meaningful results, you need to be able, if, especially if you're comparing two scenarios, use the same color map and fix it. Now notice what I did here, and I, I made that comment during one of your presentations, is like use three or five points on the color map, make your color map bigger, make the font bigger, so that we can see things, okay? I, I didn't have time to do this for you, but I would never report results like this, okay? Like with this kind of ugly min max and you know bunch of zeros over here like truncated make it just one digit precision after the decimal point okay three significant figures okay that's more than enough we don't need to see 50 see 16 digits of precision write it in scientific notation okay but oftentimes you see people especially those using fluent see the color map of like 50 points on it, it's like this is insane. I, mean, I don't care. I need to know the center where we're we're separating between high value and low values. Those are the values that you need: the min, the m median, the uh, the mean, or the median actually, and the maximum. Those are the values you care about. Okay. One D plots are best. So by one D, I say you know y versus x. Nothing else. Don't do fancy 3D surface plots. You're going to see through them. They're going to be crap. They're going to be annoying. You can't read the. You want something where you can say, okay, if x value, I'm going to go up. This is the y value. Cartesian plots. 1D plots. Beautiful. You can do contour plots sometimes, for sure. But that's that's still a like a, it's still a 1D plot. It's just curved, right? Don't do anything beyond that with visualization if you're like animating a surface but like I've seen people report the driven cavity in a like 3D surface it's I, I don't see anything it's stupid I don't want to see the surface how it's changing that you know x y versus the value of the velocity just do a contour plot because the contour plot actually with the driven cavity for example or what we're seeing we actually have a third dimension what is that third dimension color Yes, color is the third dimension. Don't use a value. Don't use an axis for the third dimension. Use color, okay? Volume rendering. Use volume rendering for all simulations. So these are some classic simulations from the Institute of Protein and Secure Energy. You think this is like a video of a bonfire? This is a simulation of burning jet fuel, okay? Look at that. Volume rendering, this was done like 10 years ago. We have the technology to do that. This is from my colleague and friend, Jeremy, <coughs> looking at flow over a flare. These, these are the vorticity contours. Beautiful volume rendered simulations. Now, do these tell you, they give you kind of about this ideas about the structure and what's going on. Um, they're cool, but I cannot extract, you know, serious um, quantitative or, or qualitative. I mean, I, you can get ideas of like what's going on here. There's like this big dead region over here. You can tell, but you can see that on a cross section. Okay, if you do a 2D contour plot. This is another one, also from Jeremy. Um, they were looking at the impact of housing a flare in an industrial facility. And they notice that the gases actually do not go out to the atmosphere. They actually get back into the industrial facility. Haven't killed anyone with that, but they were worried about that, okay? 
Um, use visualization for debugging, and I've done that numerous times. Um, one, one time when we were adding particles to our code, and um, we had particle to grid interpolants, okay? And they were off by one grid point, the interpolants. So they were giving me, they were giving okay solutions, but they were like a little bit lagged, like, you know, the impact of a particle was one, one cell away from the particle. And so I ended up plotting the particle over its impact. I did like one time step, do an interpolant, put, put a large value for temperature on the, on the particle, and then did particle to grid interpolant. The grid temperature was zero, and then I should see nearly the value of the part temp particle temperature on the grid just under it. Well, it was like one cell behind. And, and that told us like, yeah, okay, we know where this is. We fix it in a minute. Visualization, pretty powerful. That ends today's lecture.